Next, from the state capitol, State Senator Ron Sandak tells us why he's leaving the Senate to run for the Illinois House and what he sees are the high-priority issues in the spring legislative session. This runs about 10 minutes. Senator Ron Sandak, I can still say that for a little bit. Uh, thank you for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Before we get into some of the issues, I, I uh, just wanted to point out to people that we are taping this the day after the election. And uh, how are you feeling now? What time did you go to bed and what time did you have to get up to get down here to the Capitol? Uh, I, well, I feel good. I, I, it was a late night last night with uh, some friends and some porters hanging out and actually celebrating uh, their efforts. It's really incredible what uh, you get from your friends and family and those around you in that effort. So it was a late night and then it was right back at it this morning. So I'm a little blurry eyed, but all good. Probably had what, all of about two hours sleep? Or about three. <laughs> Well, that'll be good for lawmaking. Sure. Uh, let's explain one thing. I want to get into some of the issues, but just relatively to the election. It's a it's a interesting story for political junkies, perhaps. But I mean, you're a senator. You were running for the House. Why is that? And just run us through uh, what district you will now be running for. Well, as a reminder, Terry, for folks that don't know me, I'm in the 21st Senate District. I was appointed to conclude the term for Dan Cronin, who became the DuPage County Chairman. My term uh, ends in January of uh, 2013 because of the redistricting and the new maps that uh, our friends on the other side of the aisle provided to us. I no longer live in the 21st Senate District, but I now live in the newly created 81st House District. I also uh, reside within the 41st Senate District, which is uh, Senator Redonio's district, Leader Redonio. I decided it was better for me uh, to not cause a tussle with the leader. I think she's done a good job. And uh, I thought, I'll run for the open seat. It's less important about what capacity I serve in than I continue to serve. So I'm running for the House, I won the primary, and we'll see if I have a general election opponent. Right now, it's Democrats have no one up. And, and the obvious thing is, uh, first of all, congratulations on getting the nomination to your party. And for those, you are, you are the former mayor of Donners Grove. For people who don't know legislative districts, normal people. So, <laughs> to, let, let's talk. What, what is going to be the focus? As we as we are here, we are waiting for a report uh, coming out April 14th on pensions. That's one of the issues. Uh, th there's a variety of them, obviously always swirling around the Capitol. What are you focusing on this spring session? Yeah, pensions and Medicaid reform are probably the two biggest ones uh, that really require everyone's focus. Absent some adjustments, reasonable adjustments to both. There's really no fixing the state of Illinois' fiscal calamity. The budget, annual budget problem we have right now is going to continue to get worse until we address the 800-pound gorillas in the room and their pension, public pensions and, and Medicaid. I think there's finally some traction on pension reform. I don't know that there's any agreement on what it's going to be, but when you hear the governor, the speaker, and the president of the Senate now all of a sudden talking about the need for pension reform, well, you've got a, a potential recipe for something to occur. Of course, the Republicans have been clamoring for this for years. Better late than never, we'll see where it goes. You know, there's some talk about moving future obligations to the local schools for uh, teacher pensions. That has some of the local boards very upset. Don't know if it's a head fake or a real policy change the unfunded pension liabilities have to be addressed soon. They're just getting larger and they're choking room in the general revenue funds that should be going to human services, education, uh, transportation, infrastructure, stuff like that. So that's really the focus. Yeah, and others have written about this over the years, even 20 years, 30 years ago, that uh, as the pension debt grows, it's going to choke out other, it's almost like a, a weed growing in the lawn. It's just going to choke out everything else. Perhaps that's a I don't mean to insult our public res pension recipients with that analogy, but the point is it, it, it is growing bigger every yes. year and, and at a quick pace. Uh, you talked about Medicaid reform, a federal program the states participate in. It. That's also large. Uh, Governor Blagojevich expanded the Medicaid rules by raising the income level. We had Julie Hamos, who now runs that department in the state, testify last year that her computers are 30 years old. I sometimes wonder, is 
you know, everyone says they don't want to spend more money in state government, but does anyone look at just managing the programs we have better and to that and maybe spending some money because theoretically you're going to get a much better rate of return on that investment. There, we all often hear these stories of rampant uh, fraud in Medicaid and, and that they don't know either how many people are on there or if they even qualify for the benefits they're getting. Uh, kind of a two-part thing there. As far as that ounce of prevention component you speak of, there's absolutely more than a grain of truth in that notion. Of course, changing the infrastructure of that office while also, uh, you know, over the years, it's just continued to expand that program, good intentions notwithstanding, outgrew everything. Now, it's amazing none of the expenditures in that continually growing program ever went to its own infrastructure, which just shows you unplanned growth causes unplanned problems. Uh, I'm sure Director Hamos said, I, I've listened, I've talked to her. The fact is, the, 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 the scope of that well-intended, very necessary program has expanded. Looking at eligibility and, and trying to make sure the real targeted folks that require, absolutely require this service is getting it. And folks who aren't supposed to be getting it, get whatever else they need. You know, managing this program is going to be ridiculous, but talk about a program that a forensic audit and a real in-depth look at, because there's, we know that there's, there's fraud, there's, there's waste, there's abuse. Um, the All Kids program is a poster board example of a well-intended program that Blagojevich brought forward that we know people from Indiana, Kentucky, Iowa are coming over the borders and getting the benefit of our tax dollars, our services, without paying anything for it. Can't have that. So, I, you know, focusing on the scope of the program, making sure the recipients it's intended to get, the services gets it. Trying to stay focused and then looking at program upgrades where there'll be some efficiencies like you can't have 30-year-old computers. You know, that's, we know that's wasteful. So there's things that can be accomplished, but trying to prioritize this is really the challenge because there's so much that needs to get done there. I feel for Director Hamels because it really is a big endeavor. And we know the governor wants to cut $2.7 billion from next year's budget. That's not easy to do. That's going to affect people. And you, we're going to hear that real soon. We started the conversation by saying you were appointed to uh, the Senate and, and now are running for the House. So this is your first time going through an election cycle as a member of the legislature. Is there any difference? Uh, Relative, you know, we often hear politics, nothing gets done in a political year. Give us an insider's view of how, if there is a difference, how it's different in an election cycle. Uh, it's funny you say that because I was having this conversation with someone today. I'm the veteran of two municipal elections. Very different, nonpartisan. You go knock on everyone's door, not necessarily someone of your own party. Doing that while in session, and I also have a job and a family and a life, it's been really an interesting process of juggling and trying to manage as best you can good policy, policy initiatives, while also off hours, obviously off the campus site of, of, of politicking and trying to tell people why you're, you know, worthy of continuing to serve on their behalf. What ideas, ideals, propositions and policy, you know, notions you want to advance. Doing that at the same time, no small trick. Um, no small trick when you have a 15-year-old freshman or a 12-year-old sixth grader, a wife that's deserving of time and attention and doesn't want to be at home all the time by herself, all the more interesting. And I got law partners that are ready to wring my neck as well because I do have a practice. All of that means I get to take a reprieve now because the primary is over. I owe a lot of favors to people, my wife particularly. So um, while we, we do this thing here, it's going to be very interesting uh, in that regard. But at least I don't have to politic for a little while. And relative to working with members across the aisle, is there a difference or or not? I, I certainly don't want to prejudge anything. I mean, is that more or less the same or, or how? I, I, yeah, I, I don't, I, look, we, primaries are primaries, right? Uh, if you're in a Democratic primary, it's usually a fight to the left. When you're in a Republican primary, it's a fight to the right. And then in a general, it's who's the best person capable of serving that will take care of the, you know, the interests of all, and that's usually a fight to the middle. In that fight to the middle, there is a pragmatic theme that necessarily permeates. And when you get here, you can see partisan battles sometimes that make sense, and oftentimes, more oftentimes, don't. Working across the aisle, finding partners 
uh, sensible common sense partners on propositions that advance the cause of the folks in Illinois really ought to be the sentiment that pervades rather than entrenched partisan fiefdoms, for turf battles or the like. So I, I think because of the circumstances this state now finds itself in, from a fiscal calamity perspective, that pragmatism and that need to work across the aisle is naturally going to rise. I predict this will be a different session than last year and the year before, <laughs> largely because Blagojevich is gone too. But at the same time, I just think some common sense has to prevail. The, the scope, the footprint of government can't continue to grow. We're out of money. Um, you know, we're up against it. I think in that kind of distressed environment, good solutions will naturally occur. So I, I, I have faith and optimism that some good stuff's going to get done. All right, well, now Senator, perhaps soon to be Representative Ron Sandek, we appreciate you joining us again on the Illinois Channel. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Terry. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.